purpose of this space is to create a very safe environment for people to share a moment of their lives. I am Winston Young, I am your host for tonight. And I was given back this mic that I handed out uh, last October. And then pieces fell together to create the show that you are at right now. Uh, to give you a bit of insight as to what, what the show is about, I grew up with a massive dysfunctional belief that I needed permission to speak. And it kind of looked like this. You know, someone would be sitting there and you just stand very attentively waiting for your moment. And they would be annoyed that you're standing there waiting for a moment. You get your moment and then they just sit back and said, okay, so I uh, know that you've been waiting, so uh, talk. And I'm sure you would understand at that moment, in your mind, you're like, well, you're not really listening to what I have to say. And then you don't say it. And then that little voice that you have just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and disappears. And then you grow into an adult. And then you want your voice to be heard and you severely overcompensate. And I overcompensated in the way of wanting to be that guy that everyone shot in a photograph, wanted to be, want, it's, it's like it, you wanted that superstardom. And I didn't understand I actually achieved that until someone came up to me and said, Winston, why do you always need to be photographed with whomever that may be? To me, that was just normal until I finally started doing some personal development work and realized that all that was born from this belief that I needed permission to speak and that no one was listening. And if they wanted to listen, no one really cared. So I just kept that message inside of me. So the purpose of this space is to create a very safe environment for people to share a moment of their lives. There's no theme involved. The people that come up here have selected a story on their own and they're gonna share it with us to connect your heart to their heart, to create a connection and to create community within this space and then have it grow as the shows go on. seven days a week, located at the south end of the Petula Bridge at 12375 King George Boulevard in Surrey. Foodie World has 75,000 square feet of imported and domestic products, with a large selection dedicated to our Filipino kababayans. With an in-house butcher, variety of seafood, and produce from around the globe. Open every day until midnight, Foodie World, one block east of number three road off Sea Island Way in Richmond. Located one block north of St. Paul's Hospital, Downtown Denture Center features complete and partial teeth restoration options. With 35 years experience, Anthony Chung offers mobile services and emergency repair consultation 24 hours a day. Downtown Denture Center, just off Nelson at 970 Burrard in the lobby of the Electra Building. So 72 hours ago, um, as I'm preparing for this show, an individual decided that this show should not exist. So instead of speaking to me about it and working things out, uh, they chose to take a plan of action through fear and intimidation and have my speakers uh, pull out by scaring them with untruth, and it really bothered me because I know if someone wants to not like me, that's perfectly fine. I know a whole bunch of people on this planet that hate my guts, right? And I'm used to it. But if the issue was with me, then speak to me. You don't have to go and involve people that 
are not directly involved. And the part that really pained me was when I got an update from speakers that were contacted and it ruined their day. It caused them psychological and emotional stress. And it carried on for the next couple of days. And it really bugged me that instead of dealing it as like an adult, they have chosen to take a course of action that I just define as being a bully, using fear and intimidation to get what they want because they fear they fear that you're doing something they don't want to do. They are losing control of you, and the only way to get control is to go and sabotage what, you, what you're trying to create. So with that being said, I looked at the, my whole purpose of this, and it galvanized my resolve that this space needs to exist. Here's someone that goes, I don't want you to speak. Who is trying to scare someone into not sharing their message, into being silent. And by doing so, withholding a moment of their lives that they're gifting to other people. And I go, that's just, that's not right. And by looking at this, I go, you know what? Everything that you have done has proven to me that this has to happen. So it's happening, and that's why we're all here. And I thank you for coming to support this night. So now that I got that out of the way, I feel a lot better. <laughs> and before I put uh, my infamous party hat on, I'm going to uh, put out a few announcements. Uh, there is photography and video recording allowed, but I do ask that you refrain from doing it for the sole purpose that these people coming on stage are freaked out enough and they don't need a camera. <laughs> recording them as they move around. And if you do take a picture, please turn off the flash so you don't distract them. And they lose their train of thought. The second thing is a trigger warning. Uh, all of the stories are personal in nature, and some of them might encroach on very dark topics of abuse, addiction, uh, self-harm things that might trigger you. So if you get triggered and you need a time out, there's a beautiful lounge at the back and around the corner. You can go there, give yourself a time out. Okay, so I'm gonna put this hat on. So give me a second to put this hat on and we'll get the show started. Okay. Yeah, now we can get going. I didn't have uh, the chance to make that decision if I wanted to fit in or wanted to be my own person. So I chose a different route. I, wa I chose, probably looking back, the worst decision I could make. And that is, I'm going to prove the world wrong. I'm going to prove the world that I'm better than anyone that's in front of me. And that fueled 15 years of my life to go and achieve more, do more, earn more, make more, so no one could ever look down and say that I was nobody. The more I did, the more status I gained, the more infamous I became, the more crazy I became. The more money I made, the more I hated myself. At one point, <laughs> at one point my mom goes, what are you doing with all of your money? I'm enjoying life. Until I looked at my bank account, I actually had no idea that I could make and spend, oh, she just, oh. She'll know now because I'm going to tell her because she's in the room. I didn't know I could make and spend $600,000 in one year. And it didn't mean anything because inside, the more money I made, the more I hated myself. I was literally tearing myself apart, trying to be something, proving it to the world, and I was just dead inside. Every major achievement that I did had no joy in it. It was just, just another checkbox. Can you make more money? Yeah. What can, what, what can you make? 100, 200, 300 an hour? Doing what? Bragging, I'm bragging that I sit here and I'm earning 300 an hour sitting in front of a computer watching it load. But what am I doing? I'm just, I'm just hating myself. 
You can brag about it. At the end of the day, you're still walking home alone. You're not living life. I'm just dying inside. Until May 3rd, 2013 happened. And then I just decided I didn't want to die. And then I just started to change. My next speaker went through a similar process. And I very much re relate to what she has to say. So I invite her up to share. Sasha Herman. Finance and lease rates are available seven days a week. The Parks and Service Department is only closed Sundays, and there's multilingual staff on site at Surrey Honda, 15291 Fraser Highway, one block east of 152nd. Foodie World presents Philippine Street, featuring a large selection of Filipino foods. From imported non-perishable products, to both packaged seafood and locally caught and very much alive. Foodie World is 75,000 square feet of worldly groceries situated in North Richmond. Far West Financial and Insurance Agency, offering life, health, and critical illness insurance, which covers cancer, heart attacks, and strokes. Please call Leo D for more information. Okay, hi everybody. It's nice to be back up here. I was up here in July. Uh, similar theme uh, to a lot of what Winston talked about. Talking about something different today. Um, and we touched upon it already, but just a show of hands, how many people saw Oprah's uh, acceptance speech at the Golden Globes? Okay. So she talks a lot, she builds a lot on the Me Too. Um, and I actually watched it with a bit of a mixed reaction. And so a lot of what Allison was saying resonated with me. Um, because I'm not sure about the movement part about it. It, it, it did raise questions, and I think uh, that's the part I relate to, is what does this all mean? Um, but for a lot of people, it really resonated, and I think at the heart of it, I really like where we're trying to go. Um, and what I got from her message, the part that, I, I, that did land, was this idea of um, speaking up and speaking out and owning our voice uh, primarily. And it's this idea of owning our voice um, that I want to talk about. And the reason I want to talk about it is because that's really hard. For me, that's actually really hard. And I didn't realize how hard that was until Me Too campaign started because it got me thinking. It got me wondering, you know, is this something that applies to me? Um, have I had an experience that um, is, needs to be shared or is worthy of being shared? How do I talk about this uh, with the men in my life? And what does it, what does it all mean for me? Um, and I think the realization I had at the time was, um, in order to have one's voice, one really needs to know um, one's own mind, one needs to know one's own heart, and until you know your mind and your heart, only then can you have your voice. And so when Me Too came up, I realized, oh, I don't know what I would want to say about this. I don't know what I think about this. I don't know what my heart has to say about this. And so it started getting me to reflect on other parts of my life. Um, and what I realized was that I silenced myself a whole lot more than I realized. Um, you know, I, I thought back to times at work where um, I really didn't agree with the direction we were going in, but I sat on my hands, or I had an idea um, and I didn't share it. Small things like that. Uh, things of a little bit more significance. Um, you know, when you, you're, you're talking to friends and they're telling you about something that just doesn't sit right, um, and you don't want to necessarily give your opinion because they're not asking for it, but you just know you might have to anyways, and sometimes holding back there. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to romantic relationships, and you'll see a theme that that's where I spent a lot of my thinking time, but with men, I, um, I kind of got stuck as a t in, in, the, in, in being a teenager when it comes to uh, dating and relating to men. Um, and I, not that long ago, which was, was shocking, I had this, uh, person that I was dating and he said to me, and I really liked him, and he said to me, uh, can I let you know Sunday if we can see each other Sunday? And I heard myself say yes. And I was like, like, no, that I'm actually not okay with that. But I found myself saying yes and holding silent what I actually, uh, what was actually important to me, what I actually thought what was okay and not okay by me. And these little things just made me realize that I have this story. So I have this story that formulated probably in my teenage years, because that seems to be the character that keeps showing up that I'm too much, um, that I uh, take up too much space, I have a loud voice, you can hear me before you see me often, um, that I don't give enough space for other people, um, that I'm just too much. And so 
I have been putting myself in this box because I made this mistake that, and I only just realized this recently, that I have equated my personality uh, for self-expression. So I have a big personality, but when I'm interacting with others, it's often in encouragement or positivity or going along with, um, I want people to like me. Uh, and so I don't actually say what's on my mind. And the scary part is half the time I don't really know what I want. So I can't often say it if I don't know it. Um, and I didn't really even have a great depth of, or a sense of this depth um, that this was going on for me, that I was a people pleaser and um, just going along with it and didn't really have or own my voice until about two years ago. I was in coach training. I think there's a few coaches uh, in the room here with me today as well. And it was at the end of our training and we, uh, we were doing this thing where everybody in the room was taking turns talking to one another and, and having a desire, a wish for them for their future, a want for them. And this 18-year-old uh, boy came up to me and said, Sasha, what I want for you more than anything is for you to speak your mind um, and to say what's on your mind. And I actually hated hearing that. I really didn't like it. It did not land for me. I was like, what are you talking about? I, you know, I talk all the time. Um, I take up a lot of space. And I think I didn't like hearing that because I think I knew it was truth. It was a blind spot. I felt like criticism. I felt a bit hurt. Um, but I think I also knew it was truth. And I had packed the true me, the essence of me, away because uh, I wanted to fit in. And we've talked about that. There's this box, and I wanted to fit into it. I wanted to be good at it. I wanted to be liked for it. So when he said that to me, um, it, it, it got me thinking. Um, and it certainly planted a seed. I didn't do much with that seed. I mean, I think I ruminated over this for quite a while, like what does it mean to speak your mind? Because every time I'd think about it, I'd feel really uncomfortable. Um, it, it takes courage uh, to speak one's mind, and I, I guess I just didn't have it in me um, at that point. Uh, and then interestingly, about uh, six months later, I met a man. And again, I relate most of my life to my dating experience, so the men keep showing up as like <laughs> the, the teachers along the way. And I fell in love with this man. I didn't. I don't think, and I really, it wasn't him that I fell in love with. I fell in love with the idea of, of, of falling in love. But what happened in that time was I fell in love with myself. And um, I hadn't experienced that depth of openness in probably about 15 years, since the first experience of what love could be. And I found this poetic part in me. I mean, I was writing him poetry. I was like this feminine creature. I was at the beach, like splayed out in the sand, like heart open to the sky, super connected. And it was all light and it was all love and it was all beauty. And in that time, I remember talking to everybody and loving on everybody. And the more I loved myself, the more I could love them. And I was magnetic and people were, you know, drawn to me. And it was truly love breeding love. Um, and that was a, a heart-opening, cracked-wide-open moment for me, which was amazing. And then not long after that, it started to fall apart. Um, and what was so interesting about that was that in rolled the darkness. And in that darkness was this need for validation with men, um, this need, um, or, and the shame. Uh, that's where my shame primarily lives. And I didn't really know it until that point um, that I have desires and wants and needs that I've struggled with my weight my whole life and that's my sense of worthiness, that uh, being validated and liked by men is my sense of worthiness. All of this stuff came raging in at the same time and I think it was that contrast that was so powerful because I was still cracked open, I wanted so much to love, I have such a yearning to love, but this darkness just swept in over me and I was um, in a float tank, I don't know if anybody's been to those, but it's sensory deprivation, there's no sound, no sight, and um, most often when I go into these tanks, I disappear into quietness and peace and serenity, um, and it's wonderful, but not that day. That day, um, I guess having been cracked this wide open, in that tank, I heard the most terrible voices. Voices that are ugly and voices of self-loathing like a river of self-loathing I did not know existed within me. Um, and it literally broke my heart. Like the, the meanness with which one can talk to oneself is shocking. And I think those voices had been so loud for so long that I didn't even hear them. And it took that moment in a float tank, hearing those voices, for me to start screaming at them. And for the first time ever, I found my voice. I literally was screaming in that float tank, 
No, I am not fat. No, I am not ugly. No, I am not unworthy. And that was such a crazy, mind-blowing, I want to swear up here, experience because it came from this other place. It didn't come from my head. It came from this desire to stop fighting with myself and to start fighting for myself. And that was a big shift. Um, truthfully, I left there shaken. I didn't know what to do with it. I think I may have set an intention around this idea of like fighting for myself instead of with myself. Um, so I can't say that there was a formula that I followed for the next nine months. Uh, I know that I did a lot, that Hero's Journey is, is one that I relate to and uh, I did a lot of work, a lot of workshops um, as a coach, just coaching others and the, what they teach you. Um, but I also set a practice of kindness and I remember last year, New Year's Day, I said to myself, no more dieting, none of this up and down thing, can't do it anymore. That's how I evaluated my success in life as if I had eaten well the day before. You know, you're 38 years old, enough of this. Instead, what you're gonna do is you're gonna be kind to your body. So ask yourself, what is kindness? And start loving yourself and cultivating that practice of kindness and love. And it sounds cliche and it's you know all over the place, but I hadn't ever thought about approaching myself from that place of kindness, from that place of, um, you know, if I were talking to somebody um, a child that was suffering, you know, how would I treat them and why can't I treat myself that way? So that was, you know, kind of the journey for the next nine months and, and then again, um, you know, a man shows up. So what have I learned? Have I really learned anything? And uh, what happened was I, uh, um, I woke up one day in February of last year and I had had this vivid dream about the last really substantial relationship I had had. Um, and I remember it's one of those dreams, you know, you wake up and you're like, you're just not sure how your day is going to go because it's like that powerful a dream. And I said to myself, I can either choose to interpret this as poor me, I don't have love in my life and sadness and darkness and terrible things and whatever, or how lucky have I been to have love in my life? And I chose love and that was an indication for me already to, to see how far I had come. So I was choosing light instead of dark, choosing light instead of dark, trying to choose love. and. Um, later that day, I went to a party, and in comes this man that I had seen before, and we had had, you know, a conversation. I remember liking him, and he comes in, and he sits down right beside me, um, and it's on. Like, the arms are going, and we're talking, and the flirting, and, um, and it proceeded into becoming a bit of a relationship. It was a bit of a courtship at distance, and it was going really lovely, and it was wonderful, and it was the beginning of something, and I, I really, really liked him. Um, and then whether you believe in the universe giving you the things you need to learn sometimes when you need to learn them or not, I ended up in a workshop thinking to myself, I don't need to be in this. Things are great. I've got this guy. Things are wonderful. Um, and sure enough, uh, it gave, he gave me everything I needed to learn at the same, in the same curve that this workshop was giving me. And what happened basically, and I see Winston standing there, but what happened was um, it, all of a sudden he said to me, Sasha, I don't want to date. And which came, which came as a surprise, that's not where we were going. And I was in this workshop and I had access to this amazing person and we sat down and, and we went through it. And she said, okay, well, what are your options here? And I said, well, I can date him, I can sleep with him, I can be friends with him, or I can maybe be friends with him. He was asking for friends. And I was like, well, I want to date him, but he's taken that off the table. I can't do this because uh, my heart lives in my vagina, so I'm gonna you know, fall in love with him. Um, you know, and, and friends is not really what I want, but that conversation was, an, um, an aha for me because I had never before stopped to say, what do I want? It had always been, um, what does he want? How do I get him to like me? Like all of that juvenile, unempowered, you know, smallness. And what it came to was I really wanted a long-term relationship. And even that saying that out loud at the time took courage because it was having a sense of my own desire, knowing what I wanted, knowing what I thought. And then I think the most beautiful part of this whole thing for me was when I wrote him back, it wasn't blame, it wasn't, um, you know, antagonistic. It was a moment where I say is where I discovered what it means to be a queen because I stepped into this most powerful place for myself where I was able to say to him, thank you. I appreciate what you're telling me. I appreciate that you want to do these things for yourself and this is what I want for myself. And I'd never done that second part before. And I'd never also gone and told the other person, I hear you and I love you for the way you are, but this is me loving me. And we're clearly not aligned. And what was so amazing about that was that we got closer out of that. So we didn't date, but that connection between us grew and he stepped up and he became a different kind of person. 
Um, our, com our communication only got better. I became a different kind of person. And I'd like to believe that in stepping in becoming a queen, I empowered him to become a king. And when I think about all these conversations that we're having around Me Too and what does it mean and not blaming, I think when one, and I'm trying this in all my relationships now, when one can step into knowing what is okay and not okay by us first, we have to know that, like really, and it's different for everybody. When we can own that for ourselves and love ourselves enough to, to claim that, then we have the power to say to others, I respect and admire what's okay and not okay by you, and that just elevates us together. So I really believe, um, first of all, it's empowering as crap, um, but I, I, I really believe that that's kind of where I want to keep going and, and where I hope we all go, which is um, accepting and knowing our true heart's desire, speaking up in the small times so that we can speak up when it's the big times, um, and, and hopefully allowing others to do the same. So with that, I thank you very much. Sasha Herman, everyone. Located one block north of St. Paul's Hospital, Downtown Denture Center features complete and partial teeth restoration options. With 35 years experience, Anthony Chung offers mobile services and emergency repair consultation 24 hours a day. Downtown Denture Center, just off Nelson at 970 Burrard in the lobby of the Electra Building. Welcome both to Surrey Mitsubishi. Surrey is only Mitsubishi dealership. But I'm becoming a selection from all makes and models and all trade-ins are welcome. Got to decide on financing. Plus, they're certified warranty technicians for all your services and repairs. Masatan Puan sa 104 and 138 and at surreymitsubishi.com.